Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> today, we're going to talk about phantom attack evading system call monitor. My name is Rex. My name is Jinya. So, imagine an attacker compromise your Linux infrastructure. So, the attacker first uh, compromises the web app through a web app art remote code execution, and then it launches a reverse shell. Then it discovered a vulnerability on the system. He can activate privileges uh, using the pseudo vulnerability CV2021-3156. Then he's looking for secrets on the system. So he read the Etsy shadow file. And then he discovered additional uh, lateral movement opportunities by reading the SSH process environmental variable. Then he lateral moved to the second machine using SSH hijack. As he is celebrating this moment, he discovered that his reverse shell connection is gone. And it doesn't take him for too long to discover that he, his IP is completely blocked. Now let's take a look at the other side of the story. While all this is happening, our security engineer has received a bunch of Slack messages uh, for the alerts generated by his latest cloud workload protection software. And uh, the reason that this software can discover all these activities precisely is because it monitors the system calls and other process related data. Right. So for example, uh, when the attacker launches the reverse shell, there will be a connect system call. And there may be additional system calls, depends on the reverse shell that he uses. This is uh, similar for the other activities. And uh, through this talk, we are going to use open as system call as an example. So let's take a look at how one can use system calls and other process information to detect a attacker uh, reads at the shadow. So here's an example rule. The rule is trying to detect untrusted programs uh, reads the at the shadow. Let me explain what the rule means. It detects that there's an open at or open system call with the read permission and the file name is equal to SC shadow. And also the program is not in the allow list uh, that allows to read the SC shadow file. So from this rule, it should be very uh, obvious that the ability to precisely monitor system calls and other system call related data is critical for the detection for the, this attack. The agenda of this talk is we will talk about system call monitoring in more detail. And then we'll talk about the two open source system call monitoring projects that we analyze. And then we'll talk about the first vulnerability, the talk to issue which we use Benton v1 attack to exploit. And then we'll talk about the second vulnerability, a semantic confusion issue, which we use Benton v2 attack to exploit. And finally, we'll conclude the talk with takeaways. With that, I will hand uh, over to Jin Yuan to talk about the system call monitor. Yeah, so as Rex mentioned, system call monitoring is very important to detect threats. So what is system call monitoring? We can uh, define it as a technique to verify whether the application, application system call conform to the rule that specify the program behaviors at runtime. Here is a graph showing how system call monitoring works. When application system call is invoked, System call code pass is executed. If there are any hooks in the code pass, the attached program 
you'll be called to collect system call data. For example, system call arguments. The data are sent to user space monitoring agent. The monitoring agent will check if application system calls confer to the user defined rules. If not the case, it may generate errors. So typically, at least two steps should be included for system call monitoring. One step is called system call interception, which is to get notified if target system call are invoked. In order to intercept system call, you can use trace point or raw trace point. Both of them are static hook placed in a kernel code. Raw trace points are eBPF alternatives to standard trace point. It's faster because it provides low access to the arguments without processing. For this call interception, the kernel provides two raw trace points, six enter and six exit. This raw trace point can be called this function trace sys enter and trace sys exit respectively. The first arguments of this function are PT register structure, saving user registers in user kernel mode switching. In it includes system call arguments. The second parameter is sys call number. If any progress attached to this raw trace point, it will it will be executed with the same arguments as functions. Trace point has low overhead, but it only provides static interception. Different from, different from um, trace point, kpro or kreturn pro provides dynamic hook in the kernel. Using it, we can register the progress on kernel instructions, for example, on system call code pass. When the instructions are executed, it will trigger register programs. Kpro can be inserted on almost any instructions in the kernel. However, kreturnpro can only be inserted in function entry and exit. Kpro provides dynamic hook, but is slow compared to trace point. And you need to know exactly how data is placed on the stack or registers in order to read system call data. You can also use LD preload trick to intercept system call, but it's not working in all cases. For example, application is statically compiled. Ptrace system call provides another way to intercept system call. However, the overhead is high. The second step of system call monitoring is called syscall data collection, which is to collect system call data. Example, for example, system call arguments. After they are notified by system call events, the program used to collect system call data is called tracing program. For example, we can use the tracing program to collect system call arguments. As we mentioned before, tracing programs can attach to different hooks like trace point, raw trace point, kpro, or kreturn pro. When the hooks fire, tracing programs are called to collect data. There are different ways to implement tracing programs to collect system call data. You can use Linux native mechanisms like ftrace or perf events. You can also um, implement the trace programs in kernel module or eBPF programs which allow the execution of user code in the kernel. The open source project Farco and TraceZ both use the similar techniques to monitor syscall. Farco is originally created by Sysdict. It's one of the two security and compliance projects and the only endpoint security monitoring project in CNCF incubating projects. It has 3.9 case GitHub stars. It actually consumed kernel events and enriched them with information from cloud native stack like Linux, containers, and so on. Fargo supports both um, eBPF and kernel module implementation for the tracing program. Tracy, on the other hand, is originally created by Aqua Security. It has 1.1k GitHub stars. It's basically a runtime security and forensics tools based on eBPF. So unfortunately, the open source projects or other projects using the similar techniques 
are vulnerable to be attacked during Cisco monitoring. The first vulnerability is time of check, time of use. During time of check, tracing programs collect Cisco data. During time of use, Cisco data used by the kernel is different from what tracing program check. Let's take OpenS system call for example. The second parameter is called file name, which is the pointer pointing to user space buffer. Between time of check and time of use, this pointer is vulnerable to be modified from user space. So we will introduce Phantom V1 attack that can get can exploit, exploit the Pacto issue. The second vulnerability is semantic confusion. It means kernel interprets data differently from tracing programs. For example, symbolic link is interpreted differently by the kernel and tracing programs. We will also introduce phantom v2 attack that can exploit fan, um, semantic confusion. We will also demonstrate Falco is vulnerable to both phantom v1 and v2 attack, while trace c is only vulnerable to phantom v1. In order to understand Pacto, we used OpenX system call for example. We used kernel version 5.4.0, but regardless of the kernel version, if the, if the monitoring software used trace point in this way, the Pacto vulnerability will exist. To simplify, we only show the code that is related to the attack. When OpenX system call is invoked in applications, syscall handler will execute trace6 and function with two arguments, as we mentioned before. If any tracing program attached to sysenter trace point, the program will be executed. After that, syscall handler look up syscall table and jump to open at system call to open the file. Before return to applications, the handler will call trace6 access with exactly the same arguments as trace6 enter. So similarly, if there are any tracing programs attached to 6 exit trace points, the, the program will be executed. As we mentioned before, the second argument of open as system call is file name, pointer, pointing to the user space memory. The file name is passed to do this open function, and the kernel copies it to kernel buffer temp using get name function. After that, kernel use the kernel buffer to call internal function do, do file open to open the file. This is time of use for system call arguments by the kernel. If we divide the open as system call code paths into two parts based on the get name function, we get two sub code paths, CP1, code pass one, and CP2, code pass two. In CP1, the file name pointer hasn't been copied to the kernel buffer. In this case, no matter where we place the host in CP1, the attached tracing program will have to read user space buffer in order to get the file name. This is vulnerable to be changed in user space attacker. For example, if we attach tracing program to six enter trace point or to do six open using Kpro, during time of check, the tracing program will have to read the user space buffer to get the file name. In CB2, user space memory has been copied to the kernel buffer, making it not vulnerable to be changed from user space. For example, if we attach tracing program to the entry of do file open function using Kpro, the tracing program can read the kernel buffer temp to get the file name. That kernel buffer is not vulnerable to be changed for tacto attack. However, if the hook are placed improperly in CB2, tacto is still possible. For example, if tracing programs attached to six axis trace point, if you read the user space buffer to get file name. If we, as we mentioned before, we use kernel version 5.4.0, but regardless of the kernel version, 
if the monitoring software uses the trace point in this way, this vulnerability will exist. Um, Fracto is vulnerable to Hacto, and the vulnerability is tracked by CVE 2021-33505 with the scores 7.3. In particular, the vulnerability exists for Fracto with a version older than 0 0.29.0 or open source SysDig. It also affects some commercial versions based on the open source agent. This was confirmed by the open source maintainer. Please um, contact the vendor for the versions. The reason why FACO is vulnerable to tactile um, vulnerability is that it uses sysenter and sysexit trace point to intercept system calls. In that case, user space pointers are read directly by FACO trace program in both kernel module and eBPF programs implementations. In order to demonstrate the generality of Tacto, we evaluate the syscalls in Fracto rules. Please note that we only consider system calls that includes user pointers as arguments, like open S system call. And we found that Fracto is vulnerable to monitor most of these calls that we evaluate, except uh, exact list system call because Fraco doesn't read user pointer from exact list system call arg arguments directly. Instead, it reads the data from kernel um, data structure. So we evaluate trace C um, 0 0.4.0 and we found that it's vulnerable to um, many system calls like um, connect system call. One thing I need to mention is uh, there's no CVE given because the trace C authors mentioned the tactile attacks on syscalls wrappers or tracer is not is a well known issue, and trace C is no exception. And the author agrees on the fact that there's no CVE or normal findings, and therefore we could talk about it publicly. I will let the audience to interpret. So I will hand over to Rex to explain and demo Phantom V1 attack. All right, so the high level idea uh, to exploit the talk to issue is uh, fairly simple. So first of all, we want to trigger the target system call with malicious arguments. And uh, we'll let the kernel to read the malicious argument and perform the intended malicious action for us. After the kernel reads it, we will override the data structure pointed by the user space argument pointer with benign data. And uh, at sys exit, the tracing program reads the data structure pointed by the user space pointer and checks the benign data against the rule, and therefore you will not fire it. Although the high-level plan sounds simple, there is a, a few technical challenges that we need to overcome. First one is, when does the kernel thread read it? And how can we synchronize the override with the kernel thread read? Are the reading windows big enough for the system calls that we're going to attack? And uh, how do we ensure the tracing program gets the overwritten copy on time. So before I dive into the step-by-step -step exploitation, um, <clears throat> there are a few primitives that we use in the exploit, which I want to talk about. First one is user for FD system call. Um, the system call is designed in a way that the user, a user thread can handle page fault. But page fault is traditionally handled by the kernel. So what's the initial design intention for this? This was designed for memory externalization. Uh, in, in, in the case where you're running a distributed program, uh, you can run compute node and memory nodes. When the compute node 
needs a particular memory that doesn't exist in the compute node. The kernel triggers the page fault and the user space uh, fault handler. It's going to reach out to the memory node to get the desirable memory. On the other hand, if the compute node has memory pressure, it will send those memory pages back to the memory node. One very important fact about user 4FD is that once the kernel thread triggers the page fault, the kernel thread is completely paused and wait for the user space program to respond. As some of you not, uh, may already be aware of, this has been used uh, quite a bit in exploiting kernel risk condition bugs. The other two primitives I want to talk about, uh, one is interrupt and uh, the other one is scheduling. So an interrupt notifies the processor with an event that requires immediate attention. It will diverge the program control flow to an interrupt handler. Let's uh, look at the picture on the right side. So we have two cores and we have two tasks running on uh, each core correspondingly. On core zero, task A issues a system call A. And then the control flow transfer to the kernel thread to handle the system call. While it's running, the user thread on the core one triggers an interrupt. And the way it triggers the interrupt is a indirect interrupt using system call. Once the interrupt is triggered, it's uh, core zero will execute the interrupt handler. And after the interrupt is handled, it will return back to the system call routine, which handles the system call. So there are different ways to indirectly trigger system call, indirectly trigger interrupt using system call. Um, one way to do it is to trigger a hardware interrupt. So this can happen when uh, a program issues a connect system call. The CPU that is dedicated to handle networking interrupt will get interrupted. Another way to trigger this interrupt is called interprocessor interrupt. This can be done by issuing mprotect system call. So um, once the mprotect system call is issued, the memory page is uh, permission is changed, and therefore all the CPUs that are caching those memory permissions need to be updated uh, with the right memory permission. The scheduling primitive that we use, one is set, uh, scheduler. This will change the scheduling priority of a particular task. Um, this is optional in the exploit um, because for system calls with a longer talk talk window, such as networking system calls, we find that it's not needed to reliably exploit the talk to issue. But with uh, system calls related to files, the talk to window is typically smaller. And with the capability, we can 100% reliably exploit the uh, talk to issue. And then the second primitive we use is set affinity, which will pin a task to a particular CPU. Okay, so let me talk about the step-by-step -step exploitation <clears throat> in detail. Um, initially, we need to do some setup. So we set up three threads, a main thread, a user for FD thread. The user for FD thread um, can run on any CPU, and also an override thread. So the main thread will pin to CPU 3, the choice of three here is because we uh, run our experiment, one of our experiment, on a four-core system, and CPU three is used to handle the networking interrupt. But if you are using IPI interrupt, it can be any CPU. Um, and then the main thread will map a memory page A. Uh, the page is not allocated. And uh, it will register the user for FD thread to handle the page file generated for this page. 
on the uh, overrides website, we pin it to a different CPU because we want to reduce the interference between the override thread and the uh, main thread. Um, and then the override thread will just block on condition mutex once it's started. After the setup, the main thread will trigger a system call, in this case, open at, and it will specify the file name argument to point to page A. Now keep in mind that page A at this point is not allocated. And uh, so the kernel thread will trigger a page fault. Once the page fault is triggered, the user fault FD thread will write page A with the malicious file name. And then it will release the conditional mutex. And then it will issue an auto system call to return execution back to the kernel. Now, once the conditional mutex is released, the override thread will start running. And uh, it will first write the benign uh, file name. In the last stage of the attack, uh, once the execution return back to the kernel. The kernel will use copy from user and you will get the malicious path name. This is a time of check. And uh, it keeps executing until at this exit, the trees program will read the register and the reference the file name value again. This is a time of check. So this is the talk to window we have. And uh, let's see how we can use the override thread to make this uh, override successful. So the after it writes a benign name, we issue a memory consistency update using CPU instructions. And uh, as the memory consistency update takes place, we want to increase the talk to window such that we have enough time to update the value uh, for all the CPUs. So what we do is that it will issue a interrupt using system calls. And this will increase the, res the talk to window size. And then the memory consistency update applies. So the file name now points to the deny file name. And then the tracing program will read out the deny file name and check it against the rule, which will now fire anything. Now let's take a look at the demo. Okay, so in our first demo, we're going to attack Sysdig um, for using connect system call as an as a example. So what we'll do is we will run Sysdig and ask it to monitor connect system call and just filter the data on our attack program. And then on another window, we will use TCP dump to monitor all traffic going to port 80. And then we'll run our attack program. The attack program, uh, it will connect to 1.1.1.1, but then it will override this uh, IP address with uh, IP address from linking.com. Okay, so we can see that the TCP dump report traffic actually going to 1.1.1.1. This is what happens on the wire. But Sysdig will report that, okay, this program attack connect is actually connecting to 13.107, 42.14, which is the IP address owned by LinkedIn.com. And therefore, we showed that we can write this uh, with arbitrary value. Okay, so uh, now we'll show a second demo. Uh, 
In this demo, we'll show an attack on Sysdig on the open ad system call. Now, our demo setup uh, is slightly different. So for open ad, the talk to window is small. So if we don't use uh, capsis nice, sometimes the attack will fail. But if we assign capsis nice, we can achieve 100% reliable exploitation. Um, keep in mind that because the override thread has the highest scheduling priority, so sometimes it can write the uh, file name faster uh, than the kernel reads it. So when that happens, the system call will get the benign file name, and the sysdig will also get the benign file name. So there's no harm being done and no alert being fired as well. Um, and therefore, we run the experiment 15 times using our script. And each time we check what is uh, what does a syscall read and what does a sysdig read. And then we'll compute the result based on uh, each observation. So what we'll do is we'll print out the number of success uh, attack the number of uh, attack that has no harm, and also the success rate. OK, so as you can see here, there in the 15 experiment, we succeed three times, no failure, and 12 times, there's no harm. And therefore, the success rate is 100%. OK, so lastly, we'll show a demo on Tree C as well. And here, we'll attack a connect call in tree C. The attack setup is very similar to what we have for the Sysdig. Again, uh, tree C will monitor the connect system call and will just filter the data on our attack program reported by tree C. And then we have TCP done monitoring on port 80, and then we run the attack. As you can see that the actual traffic going on the wire is going to 1.1.1.1. But tree C reported that the Traffic going is going to 13107, 42.14, which is overwritten by us. Okay, so um, this is, uh, I just want to reiterate that the capsis nice is optional. It depends on the system call that you're attacking. And uh, for networking system calls, typically this is not needed. And for file base, typically this is needed to achieve 100% reliable exploitation. And then I'll talk about the second uh, attack, the semantic confusion. Uh, the idea of the attack is fairly simple. Um, the kernel and the tracing program can interpret data differently. So. Uh, we use file link as an example. Uh, when the kernel reads a link, it will try to resolve the link and uh, read the actual file. But when the tracing program reads the link, it will just uh, take the link as the argument and use that to check in the read. So Falco is vulnerable to this uh, semantic confusion attack because it didn't uh, resolve the link. Uh, in the system call. Um, there's no CVE given because they mentioned that symlink and symlink at, link and link at are all monitored by Falco. But practically, um, detection team need to track all these symlink at uh, or link, link at to all these file based rules if the attacker is using those. And Tracy is not vulnerable to this attack because he use a uh, mitigation in RSM hook 
which uh, Junyuan will talk more in a later slide. So I just want to quickly show the example of phantom V2 attack uh, in Sysd. Remember this rule that we talked about at the very beginning and uh, see that the file name, actually we checked that whether the file name is uh, FT shadow, okay? So in order to exploit this, we can create a file link, temp shadow pointing to FT shadow. And then the tracing program will read the same link, FT shadow. And then the system called OpenNet sees the temp shadow and check against the rule. It doesn't match SC shadow, and therefore the rule is bypassed. Okay, so with that, I will hand over back to Junyuan to talk about mitigations. Yeah, so um, for mitigations, there are two, basically two approach for the um, phantom attacks. So one is to detect the potential exploit is happening. This was proposed and partially implemented by faculty. It has included in faculty uh, release in version 0 0.29.0. Basically, it's trying to detect the following behaviors used by the exploits. For example, it detects the unprivileged use of user 4 FD system call. This was uh, implemented and detect the user registers uh, memory address range and also detect a user copying a continuous memory chunk into a user of the register range and so on. The second way to mitigate phantom attacks is to read the data that actually used by the system call or the kernel. In order to do that, you can hook LSM functions to get those system call data that is actually used. LSM hooks function is a list of checkpoints that are placed in a kernel before operations happens on a kernel object. So here is the um, table showing a list of the LSM hooks used by C version 4. And the second column shows the system call that was that is pro uh, protected by the LSM hooks from uh, phantom attacks. We can also read those data that's used by the kernel from kernel data structure. For example, in order to read the arguments of exact V, tracing programs can read it from the MM structure from the kernel. I will hand over back to um, Rex to conclude. Okay, so um, basically <clears throat> in this talk, we show that phantom attack is generic and it exploit the fact that kernel and tracing program can read data at different times. This is exploited by phantom v1. And we also show that the phantom attack can exploited the fact that kernel and tracing program can interpret data differently. This is exploited by phantom v2. Um, we demonstrated that kernel raw trace point on system call are not ideal for secure tracing. And uh, for other tracing implementations, such as uh, capable, it could also be vulnerable if it is not implemented properly. For mitigation, uh, one can use detection for abnormal usages on fault user for FD, or to ensure that the kernel and the secure tracing program reads the same data and interpret the data in the same way. Um, if you're interested in discuss further, feel free to contact me on Twitter and uh, we'll share the GitHub link uh, at Twitter as well. So before we conclude, we also want to thank all these uh, people during our research, Chris and Joe, for uh, the discussion on the eBPF and kernel tracing and TopTo, also Yu on TopTo. And lastly, we really appreciate the Falco open source team. They are very professional handling the issue. We had uh, really good discussions from there. Thank you very much.